to Safety Ridge on Sunday. Well, this morning, we are back to the future. Liz Truss, Britain's shortest serving prime minister, has written an extraordinary article in this morning's Sunday Telegraph where she blames the left wing economic establishment for bringing her down. We were promised 3,000 words. It ended up at 4,000. I guess that's inflation for you. And she's promised to be back with even more interventions in the coming weeks, which I'm sure Rishi Sunak will be absolutely delighted about. We'll see what I guess think of the Liz Trust comeback on the show this morning. So we're going to be talking to the business secretary, Grant Shapps, on the programme this morning. We will also speak to his opposite number, the shadow business secretary, Labour's Jonathan Reynolds. Meanwhile, there's another part of the public sector and emergency services on the brink of a major strike. We'll be joined by the General Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union, Matt Rack. And with yet more tension between the US and China, we'll speak to the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Alicia Kearns. And there's a dark cloud hanging over the UK's biggest police force as the Met faces a loss of public trust. We'll speak to His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, Matt Park. Hello, good morning. Well, let's start today, shall we, with the view from the government. We can crack straight on. A little earlier, I spoke to the business secretary, Grant Shapps. It feels like today is all about the return of Liz Truss. Are you glad to see her back? Well, she's, uh, you know, uh, written this article and obviously wants to uh, provide a, a, a bit of her background thinking. But actually, in, in, in many ways, I think uh, what she has had to say... Um, you know, will be things that people knew about her all, all along. Um, that she was saying it when she was um, she was briefly prime minister. The most important thing now is uh, to get on with the things that we've described, and, and the, the current prime minister has been very clear about his priorities, which you know really really matter. And getting inflation cut in half will be a big priority. Yeah. Growth in the economy, which is something which of course Liz wants to do herself, um, reducing debt. Uh, which we think is very important, um, cutting the waiting lists in the NHS, stopping the small boats. So all those priorities, I think, are things the whole country will get behind. We'll definitely talk about some of the priorities uh, later. But you know, Liz Truss pictured uh, on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph saying, I was brought down by the left-wing economic establishment. What is the left-wing economic establishment? Well, people can read the uh, long article to, to, to get her version uh, but what, what, of what that. But what is she talking about, would... do you think, the left-wing Well, I mean, she describes it, doesn't she? she? She she describes it in the article. But what, what I was going to say is, and she says it herself, the most important thing that we can do for the British people is make sure that the economy is stable, in particular, that inflation's falling. And she says it herself. W whatever the intentions, the markets weren't prepared for it. And she, I think she, she describes in the article how, um, and I think it's true, you've got to deal with the fundamentals first. You've got to reduce inflation, which is the biggest tax cut I mean, anybody really, can have. That's not really what she's saying in the article, is it? I mean, she sounds to me like she's basically saying that she had the right priorities. And you talk about the markets. I mean, I'm assuming that's what she means by the left-wing economic establishment. You know, the £45 billion pound of unfunded tax cuts that crashed the pound and led to the Bank of England having to make emergency re measures to stop a run on pension funds. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, you'd have to get her in the studio and ask her. I did read in the article, um, I, I noticed she said that they hadn't prepared the ground for these uh, big tax changes. And I think the truth is, and we know this, what you've got to do first is deal with the big sort of structural issues. So deal with inflation first, um, deal with the, the debt so you're on a downward trajectory, and, and, and then you look towards tax cuts. Everyone wants a, a lower tax economy. Uh, we still have a lower tax economy than, than say, Germany or, or France or Italy, but it's really important that we, uh, that, that we deal with the big fundamental issues, halving do inflation you, first, for do, example. Do you think it's a bit deluded? For her to write an article... Look, I think anybody who has served uh, in, in public office has a right to put across their arguments. That's what we do as politicians, right? You, 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 you say what you believe and you put them across. She's got People a right can to put, read it she's got a, and make she's, their own conclusions. She's got a right to put across her arguments, mm. but at the same time, if you're a Conservative MP, you know, I was going to say in a marginal seat, but to be completely honest, right now, pretty much all Conservative uh, seats are marginal ones. 
you're going to be reading this with your head in your hands, aren't you? All it's doing is reminding people uh, of the shortest serving prime minister who not only crashed the pound, but she crashed your poll ratings as well. Well, as I say, people can read it and come to their own conclusions. And I mean, I am so a... what is your I own a, conclusion? Yes, I was going to say, I'm, it, a, I'm a Conservative MP, so you're sort, of, you're sort of asking me, in a sense, what I think about it. And actually, I want to make sure that we, we have a really stable economic basis for this country. So, yeah, but so what things do you, like... What do you think of the actual Liz Truss article? Because you're asked, answering a slightly different question there, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, well, I was going to say, what we do know is what happened when we followed that route without having laid the groundwork. So I completely agree with Liz's instinct to have a lower tax economy. What we also know is if you do that before you've dealt with inflation and dealt with the debt, then you end up in, in, in difficulty and you can't get the growth out of nowhere. So, I mean, I, look, I, I think the main thing for people to know is Rishi Sunak's come in, he's removed that premium that we saw because the markets didn't like what was going on back then uh, and entirely removed the additional premium that was being applied to our, essentially our mortgage rates. Um, so we're back to where we, we should be. And he's getting on with the, 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 difficult, the difficult job of in a world where Putin's invaded... Uh, a country, a neighbouring country, and inflation has therefore gone up. He's got on with the difficult job of, of, of dealing with those things. So I think rather than looking back, and I know you're tempting me to sort of give a, well, a just, running commentary I'm on something which looking, happened several months ago. I'm not just looking back. I mean, part of the reason that I think it is important to talk about Liz Truss is that, you know, there's been a lot of briefings from her allies to say, look, she wants to make a return to politics. And she said that in her article herself, that, you know, in the coming kind of months, she's going to be putting out her vision. Some people say that, look, she's waiting in the wing. She's ready to have another crack at it. I mean, would you serve in a Liz Truss shadow cabinet? Well, look, well, first of all, I am focused on Rishi Sunak, making sure that we win the next election by sorting out these very difficult problems. And this is the thing which I think is often missed in this discussion. I mean, the way this is framed often, you think these are problems that are only facing the United Kingdom. But actually, if you look almost everywhere else... They're not, they're they're not they're only the facing same, the United Kingdom. The same Kingdom, issues the same are time, facing all we Western are, countries. We are the only G7 economy with a smaller economy than uh, pre-pandemic. If you look at the IFS forecast, we are bottom uh, of the chart. Well, uh, so one of these things where, it, uh, in part, depends which stat you want to look at from which period. So, for example, last year, we probably had, according to the IMF and the OECD, the fastest growing economy in 2022 in the G7, probably in, in 2021 as well, the fastest growing. Now, this because year, they're saying it will be... Because we so much, right? Well, That's we we, right. Had a, we had a rapid contraction, but then, of course, we came out of the of COVID first because we... of the lockdown first, because we had the, uh, the the vaccine, which we managed to develop. But it still first. has a smaller so, so what, what, what I'm, So what I'm trying economy. to say is, is you end up in a situation where... Depends which year you look at to see what the bounce back is. One of the interesting things I didn't see much reported from last week's reprojection, uh, which, as you say rightly, showed uh, a, 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 a more negative position this year, showed a more positive position next year. But my main point is, you know, Putin invades Ukraine. Inflation goes sky high because of energy prices. This government, actually under Liz Truss, as it happens, but pushed through by uh, Rishi uh, Sunak, has paid for about a third of people's energy bills to try and help people through these difficult times. And we're still doing that. So people probably don't realise when they look at their sky-high energy bills that the taxpayer, the government, has stepped in, is paying a third of that. Now, of course, that's going to have a big hit on any economy. But the point is, you know, Rishi's said it, first of all, deal with that inflation, don't feed that inflation, and then make sure you're growing the economy and then make sure you're reducing the debt cutting the NHS waiting list, stopping the boats. Um, That's our priority. Let's talk a bit about energy bills, uh, shall we? Because, you know, British Gas hit the headlines in the last few weeks because of uh, an expose by The Times, which shows um, what is happening to people uh, when companies come in and they forcibly install prepayment metres, which effectively means that if you don't put enough money in, then your energy gets cut off. And there, there was this really moving story, uh, uh, an undercover story, where there's a family with the kids' clothes on the radiators. There was a note on the door, one of the doors to the girls' bedroom saying, no boys allowed apart from daddy. And they went in when that family went out and they forcibly installed a prepayment meter. What are you going to do about it? Uh, well, first of all, it's absolutely disgraceful. Uh, we've already hauled in the boss of British Gas, made absolutely clear he accepts that they've got it completely wrong. I also think that the regulator, this is off Gem, have had the wall pulled over their eyes, actually, because I had already uh, made clear to them uh, that they needed to be making sure that the energy providers weren't carrying out this sort of outrageous behaviour. I mean, literally involves, as you described, 
invading somebody's home and forcibly changing the meter to a prepayment meter. That's not right at all. And um, unfortunately, what the regulator was doing was going back to the energy company and saying, are you following all the rules? And the energy company, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. That's not the way to do this. I've required a plan for this Tuesday uh, from the energy companies and from F Ofgem, uh, which needs to include uh, the regulator going direct to the end consumer and the end consumer being able to report these things direct to them. Uh, these kind of abuses are not on. I've called for all of the energy companies to prevent, to stop this process, as uh, British Gas have and others like Ovo had stopped it some time ago. And I want to make sure that this does not occur in Britain, in modern Britain today. It's absolutely disgraceful. No one should have their home invaded like that. It's interesting you mentioned the regulator there. 33,000 complaints to Ofgen about prepayment metres last year. Are they fit for purpose? Well, I, look, I, I, I want to uh, I want to make clear that Ofgem needs to raise their game on this. Um, it, it cannot be acceptable simply to take the assurances of the electricity companies or the, the, the power companies uh, when they when when we know that these abuses have been taking place. Even before that Times article, I had set out to the energy companies and Ofgem that I had serious concerns, and that's before we saw this undercover uh, investigation. And look, we have laws that prevent people from being uh, cut off from their electricity. There's no point me and the government paying a third of the bill on behalf of taxpayers. So every, every homeowner is getting about a third of their bill paid this year uh, because of these sky-high energy prices, only to have the energy companies come in and undermine that effort. So we're trying to provide energy security for every household and businesses in this country, and we will not have the system undermined like this. Is, is, have you done enough as well? Because you, you talk a, a lot about, you know, how you stepped in, blah, blah, blah. But you've only just done this pretty recently. This is not a new practice. This was going on last year as well, wasn't it? Why have you not acted sooner? Yeah, well, I've only been, uh, of course, Business and Energy Secretary for about three months. Yeah, but the but prior have to been that, in power yeah, what, but, you know, but over prior, a decade. But prior to that, I was going to say, we've never had a situation in this country where the state has been involved in helping to pay people's energy bills, about a third of your energy bills being paid. Yeah, but this, I'm not talking but, about but, this. I'm talking but, about the practice of prepayment. The, but the, the two things are connected. The reason why we're doing that and the reason why there's been a big increase in, in this, uh, I would say, abuse of people's homes, people being evaded to have their, their uh, metre changed, is because of the high energy costs. So, of course, naturally, this is not an issue that was very high on the mm -hmm. agenda until Putin invaded Ukraine uh, and he created this spike in energy uh, but, but, prices. So, you know, this has now been... Uh, uncovered, okay. uh, and we are taking pretty swift action. You're, you're, you, you say you're taking swift action. Um, you've called in British Gas, given him a talking to. You're writing to the energy companies to give them a talking to. Is there anything you're doing other than basically giving people a talking to? Why not a total ban? Well, people people could lose their uh, licences ultimately. And the reason you wouldn't want a total ban is, I mean, to give you one simple example, my Son, 21, uh, lives in a, in, in a flat in London, which he, he shares. Um, it's actually very convenient for them to have a prepayment meter. It, 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 you know, there are, there are situations where you want to be able to have that kind of flexibility. So I don't think we should be banning all prepayment no, meters. No, but are you, would you ban anyone switching to a prepayment meter without permission? Oh, well, well, first of all, there is a legal process that has to be gone through. I'm, the not, other... I'm not talking about the legal process, because I understand there's yeah. various hoops you have to jump through, but should you have a total ban on people having a prepayment meter if they don't want one? So, well, I was going to say, the legal part of the process is important, because this can't happen without a court saying, yes, you can do this. So I have a... a but, court, but court's been doing it on well, that. Well, so the whole point isn't. They've just been signing them through. So, so, so I was going to say, the, the rest of that is I think there's also a very legitimate question about why thousands of these have been being waved through. That is supposed to be the, the check on the system. And, and to answer your question more fully, obviously people need to pay their bills, mm. and so there has to be a backstop of, look, what happens if so you don't pay your bill. So that's the crux of it. You think that but, basically there does need to be a last-case scenario but, resort if someone can't pay their but, bills. But, of course, ultimately, if you don't pay your bill, then people are taken to court. That's mm. the system we live under, right? But I think ultimately there's a legitimate question to ask about why thousands of these warrants have been waved through without uh, proper consider consideration on an individual okay. basis. So I think there's plenty that's gone wrong here and I'm absolutely going to fix it. OK. Um, the Sunday Times today says that Rishi Sunak is planning some tough new immigration laws that, in their words, would take Britain to the boundaries of international law. Uh, now, Sky News understands the PM is looking at banning people who arrive in the UK on small boats from appealing. 
Um, is that true? Well, so first of all, uh, when you read those kind of headlines, it, it makes it sound like we're talking about all forms of immigration, including refugees. I have yeah. refugees living in my own house, and Ukrainians, three Ukrainians and their dog living in my own house. This, com this country and this government has been incredibly open and generous to genuine refugees. What we can't have are boats arriving here with illegal uh, gangs and gang masters uh, trafficking, people trafficking people here, and to be impotent in, in return. And so uh, Rishi is absolutely right to apply the full force of the law to stop this illegal trade in human misery. And I think he is absolutely right to pursue that. And I think he's right to make sure that we can change the law, something, by the way, Labour vote against at every single opportunity. So the question... They don't want to stop the small boats, and we do. The question is, is the PM looking at banning people arriving on small boats from appealing against deportation? So uh, I, I think the direction here... Uh, I haven't seen that specific story, but the direction here is quite straightforward. If you come here via an illegal route, so you come here to claim asylum, and you know in the first place the way you're getting here is not legal, you haven't got an aeroplane, you haven't got a, a commercial service, You've just been trafficked illegally, then if you come here via that route, then you 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 shouldn't get uh, rights. And that I think is quite you a basic. Get rights. You shouldn't you shouldn't get rights if you're brought if you if you consent and you come here through illegal routes. What we must have is a situation where people can come here legally and claim asylum, but not illegally. Yeah, but the, I think the point is that you can't come here legally to claim yes, asylum, you can. can you? Yes, Unless you are from people with specific people routes come here from all, Ukraine, from Hong people Kong, come here from all, Afghanistan. People come here all the time and legally claim asylum when they get here. So, but the, the important thing is, they haven't been people trafficked so, to get here. Yeah. They, they bought a ticket to get here the, rather than being people trafficked. And people are paying for that trip, by the way, huge amounts of money. Uh, to the, to the yeah. gang masters. It's not they're getting here free. It's not they're coming here via that route because I'm just, it's a free I'm just way of getting here. I'm just disputing whether there is well. legal routes for people to come here and claim asylum legally, given you have to claim asylum in the first safe country you pass through um, to get here. Which, which, which also calls into question why it is that that hasn't already happened before people end up That's being a different debate. people trafficked, doesn't I'm it? just questioning because whether, they could already whether there are safe and legal routes for people from countries other than those Well, all, all I'd say is I don't think there's a country with a bigger heart when it comes to taking people in, say, including, as it happens in my own home, bringing okay. refugees here, but you've got to have that through legal routes. Uh, now, next week, we're going to see nurses and ambulance workers walk out in what will be the biggest ever NHS strike. Will that put lives at risk? I'm concerned that it does, if you have a situation, which is what has been happening so far, where you don't have cooperation between the backup services, typically the army, uh, and uh, and the people who are striking. So we've seen a situation where the Royal College of Nursing have very responsibly, before the strike's taken place, told the employer, the NHS, this is where we're going to be striking, and they're able to put the emergency cover in place. Unfortunately, we've been seeing a situation with the ambulance uh, unions where they refuse to provide that information. That leaves the army, who are driving the backups here, in a very difficult position, a postcode lottery if it comes to you're having a heart attack or a, a stroke when there's a, a strike on. We cannot have that situation. And that's why I'm introducing laws for minimum safety levels. You, um, we've seen waves of strike action, right? And one of the very first unions to strike were the rail workers. You mm. were a transport secretary. It feels to me like some people are, I guess, blaming you, really, for the lack of resolution. Um, here's Mark Harper. This is the current transport secretary. And he has said, what I've tried to do since I got this job was to... I met the unions, I've tried to change the tone of the conversation so that we're coming across as more reasonable. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's having a dig at you there because you didn't meet the unions. He's just implying that you didn't come across as reasonable. Uh, no, well, I'm absolutely certain it's not because Mark and I talk about it and we, we, we get on uh, very well, so I don't think that's the case at all. Um, and actually, interestingly... Do you regret the, unions... the tone that you no, adopted? Uh, no, uh, look, let me just answer the question. Interestingly, the union said, if you'll just let us talk to you directly rather than talking to the employers, who, by the way, are the people who need to resolve this, then this whole thing could be over. They've now had months and actually, by the way, two transport secretaries since me 
uh, where they have had those discussions and they've carried on striking. So the whole thing was, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a screen that they were putting up to sort of pretend that was the reason why they needed to strike. Some might say, though, if you if you'd engage with the unions and the legitimate concerns people had about pay and inflation much earlier, then we wouldn't be in this situation now, where it feels like both sides are totally entrenched in the possibility of resolution across all sectors. Well, that's very really hard to see. Well, first of all, I, I did meet with. I mean, it was during COVID a lot of the time, but I did meet with uh, Mitt Lynch during. Uh, COVID online. Uh, I've got no objection to, I mean, I think it's a good idea to, to meet and speak. The simple point I was making is the dispute okay. is one which is between the unions and their employers, and they're the only people who can resolve okay. it. And I really want to see it resolved. And i just say this, I really want to see it resolved. You know, um, we, we've got, it, it's incredibly sad that some people who are the least well off are being hurt the most by, for example, the train strikes, where somebody who maybe is a hospital porter, a, a cleaner, who physically has to go to the job, can't work from home, those are the people who are being hurt. So I think the quicker this is resolved, the better. And I very much hope that, you know, em employers and unions will get round the table. And if ministers can help, great. All the evidence is, it, you know, that, that not been the, the show changer so far. Uh, now, I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't ask you about this uh, in the interview. Um, on a very different note, just talking about your social media presence, I just want to have a look at something. Now. Leveling up will be defined by action. And that's exactly what this government is doing today. Hi, can I get a flat white, please? But currently, inflation is about 10%. I know what you're thinking. Is he going to eat all of that by himself? What if I told you this cake is actually totally guilt-free? There has been a explosion of what I would describe as kind of cheesy government <laughs> social media videos that I am blaming you for, for starting them off. What is going on? They're guilty. Well, look, I, I just think we can spend our time, like, talking to the Westminster Insider bubble. Actually, if you send a regular tweet, that's what you do. Everyone will get very excited. Um, or uh, I've certainly found um, that if you produce videos which are, like, more interesting... I did one with Michael Portillo, uh, about Great British Railways. Uh, I've, I've done others with sort of former uh, uh, people from, sort of, for, for example, from Top Gear. Uh, and actually, you can cut through and you have millions of people. Do you think people. the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are trying to get in on your act, then? I think they are, yeah. I've got to be honest. I think they're, <laughs> they're following my leader. Um, but I just think, you know, in the modern world, if you want to actually talk to the country at large, then you need to get out there. I, you didn't show it there, but I also am on TikTok and other places because you just get to the people who you might want to engage with. And another, that's, um, the, that's the beauty of, of social media. Another, oh, we're out of time, but another photo that did go viral, viral was this one. Um, put it on your Twitter account. There you are, with <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> and as if by magic, he's gone. <laughs> it was a complete screw-up. Uh, somebody at that time, which was, I think, 18 months, two years ago, had screwed around with a picture, actually somebody with a, a, a Pixel phone, which... Uh, it does that. And accidentally, it was picked out the file and sent. Not deliberately. I, I love Boris Johnson. I, I enjoyed working with him. So are, no are reason you, um, to want to do that. Are you going to go around there brushing Liz Truss out? Yeah, I know. I, I, actually went, well? I, actually went to, I actually went to see the, the day that went out. I took it down as soon as I found out uh, what happened. Uh, I actually went to see um, Boris and I said to him, let's take a photo and I'm going to uh, like tweet it saying there's no way of brushing him out this one or something like that. You know, but... Uh, it, it, do you say yes? Do you, do you refuse? <laughs> we got the photo, but I didn't post it in the end. <laughs> but it was a complete screw up, not uh, deliberate at all. OK, thank you very much for being on the programme. Welcome. Go on, chaps. Anyone will believe him, I'm sure. Um, tomorrow is expected to be the biggest day of strikes in the history of the NHS. Ambulance workers and nurses in England will walk out once again in the long-running and increasingly bitter dispute over pay. And foreign rescue services are likely to become the latest part of the public sector to strike very soon as well. Uh, the Fire Brigade's union members have voted to strike and union leaders will hold talks with the government on Wednesday. Well, the Fire Brigade's Union General Secretary, Matt Rack, uh, joins us now. Um, good to have you on the programme. Uh, what do you expect to happen next week, then? Well, we, we will be meeting our employers, not the government, actually. Mm -hmm. They don't uh, have a role directly in our pay negotiations, and in a way we're quite pleased that they don't. Uh, we, we can negotiate with our employers, and we hope we can resolve this dispute. But I'd like to say something about why we're even in this mm -hmm. position, because firefighters have voted in huge numbers, an overwhelming vote for strike action 
But they don't do that lightly. They've done that because they've had 12 years of endless attacks on their pay. So that uh, on the basic rate of pay, a competent firefighter, which more than half the workforce are on, uh, is using the government's preferred measure of CPI some £4,000 a year worse off than if we'd kept up with inflation. Uh, and you, you know, no matter how much you love your job and want to serve the community, at the end of the day, people have bills to pay, rent to pay, mortgage to pay, and families to look after. And people have been brought to that point. How much do firefighters get paid then? So a competent firefighter is on just over £32,000 a year for a 42-hour week. So we're working longer than the average working week for a basic uh, pay. Our, our members work permanent shifts generally. Most of the overwhelming majority of whole-time firefighters work permanent shifts, including permanent weekends and so on. Uh, and that's for £32,000 a year, with high rates of pension contribution, for example. Now, you, I think I'm right in saying you rejected a pay offer of 5% uh, last November. What percentage are you looking for? Well, we started, let, let's look at how it's uh, unfolded. We were offered 2%, uh, and I've got to say, if perhaps if our employers hadn't started by offering 2%, our members might have, might have reacted differently, I don't know. Uh, by then, uh, inflation had begun to take off significantly. It wasn't me who rejected 5%, it was our members. We put it to a secret yeah. ballot, and they voted by 79% to reject that. Yeah. I, I'm not in a position to say what would settle it. We're in discussions with our employers employers yeah. and I'm not going to negotiate on Sky TV uh, but we, we will be meeting them on we're discussing with them this weekend and tomorrow and we meet them on Wednesday we hope would it we can... be would it be fair to say um, and, and I, I look we, we get this a lot from union leaders understandably you don't want to negotiate live on TV um, but are you looking for a pay rise to match inflation double digits that's effectively what you know the nurses have given well it seems to me personally that anything less than that is a, a pay cut but that's for our members to decide. Our members have to weigh up all sorts of things. The going on strike is not easy. Going on strike is a struggle. People lose money. When, you, when I hear government ministers talk about union barons calling people out on strike, they don't understand at all the, the real difficult decisions that workers have when they go on strike. So our members will weigh up all sorts of things. I hope that the fire service employers will come in and improve their offer in a way that we can put to our members and our members will decide for themselves. So, um, you know, what the government would say is, look, if, if they give all public sector workers a pay rise that matches inflation or even, you know, is higher than inflation in some cases, that A, further stokes uh, inflation, but also it's unaffordable at a time when we are spending more on our debt interest than the entire education budget. Well... Uh... First of all, there's no evidence whatsoever that wages have caused this round of inflation. I there's think that not that it caused, but that it will make it worse. Well, uh, the there's no evidence that public sector pay drives up inflation at all. It may lead to Im impacts on taxation. But let's look at the mess we're in. It wasn't firefighters or teachers or nurses who caused the economic mess we are in. We see in the press today that Liz Truss trying to redeem herself. Well, perhaps the Conservative government should look a bit closer to home as to who caused the economic chaos that working people are now being asked to pay for. Are you concerned that lives could be put at risk if firefighters go on strike? Well, of course, we don't underestimate the seriousness of what we are doing, and, and our members understand that. But, as I say, at the end of the day, people have uh, families to look after. In terms of safety, yeah. uh, we are... Uh, the, the government has brought in legislation, long before this new legislation, to require fire services to put in place resilience plans, as it's described, contingency arrangements, and each uh, year they're supposed to check that. We've always been assured by ministers and by chief fire officers that all those plans are perfectly adequate. So that's their responsibility. The question about public sa safety is one that sits with the government and with chief fire officers. It is their responsibility, not the responsibility of firefighters. You say, who are you say, to look you after know, you their say wages. that the safety <coughs> is, on, is, is at the door of the government and others, not individual uh, firefighters. But if I just want to look at, for example, this is uh, Billy Holland of the West Midland Fire Brigades Union. He said, um, we expect fire services to depend on the small number who choose not to strike to provide cover 
during any periods of action. It goes on to say, you know, there will be an agreement that allows firefighters and control staff to respond to major incidents during strike action if they wish to do so. I mean, it sounds an awful lot like you are putting, well, you know, well, safety on individual firefighters to make that First of all, decision. we need to look at the legal response. The legal responsibility sits with the fire authority and the chief fire officer. We have uh, reached, since 2002, in any dispute we've had, we've reached what's called a major incident agreement. That allows firefighters to return to work in cases of major incident. That's negotiated at a national level and then applied at a local level. Well, Billy Holland will be reflecting what his chief officer has said in the West Midlands, as they have all over the country. Don't worry about it. And we can provide the quotes where they have said, i.e. the chief officers, don't worry, I've got it all in hand. They've never spoken to us about any of this, by the way. Mm. Uh, the, the chief officer there will not have been negotiating with Billy though the details of what they have in place. That's, as I say, a matter well, for guess, the chief officer. I guess, you know, look, look, you're talking about the legal responsibility, and I'm sure you're completely right, you know, you're a guy who's very across the details. I, I defer to you on it. But I guess I'm just talking about the the gut instinct that people have, you know, the, the fear that people will have. Oh, my gosh, the fire brigade is going on strike. Am I going to be safe? What if there's a big fire? What's going to happen? But, Sophie, the, 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 we did not call strikes. We announced before we... I'm not uh, talking about no, blame. Just, I'm just me, talking about what... what let me make what, a point. What we, we, people we expect? Delayed. If there is a big fire, what happens? We delayed calling any strikes for 10 days to allow our employers to negotiate a settlement. We want to avoid a strike in the first place. At the re we've got to look at why there are strikes in uh, key sectors, health, ambulance, fire service, because yep. 12 years of driving down workers' wages, look, and that's said, not acceptable. You've, you, you, look, you, you've made your uh, point you know, eloquently about you know, who is to blame for the strike. In your view, you know, the government, the cuts, people can't uh, get a decent living, that they're working long hours in the fire brigade service. Putting all of that to one side, my, my question, I guess, is what happens if there is a big fire? Do people attend? If there is a big fire, and that's a major incident, and as I say, we've got an agreement that allows a return to work in certain circumstances. That's happened in previous disputes. In fact, a Conservative minister approached me during one such incident and, and a return to it was agreed. That's happened in the past and it's, we've seen it happen in other sectors. So we have examples of where we have resolved those particular sorts of threats. So you're, you're confident that lives won't be put at risk by the strike then? No, the question of whether safety is put at risk is one that sits with the government and with chief fire officers. So you can't answer that question then? I, I can't answer that because I'm not involved in those discussions. OK. Uh, now, we'll talk to Labour's Jonathan Reynolds um, directly after this uh, interview. Um, I'm interested to know what your message is to him, because Labour so far has said, look, you know, we would get around the table with striking workers, we would try and negotiate uh, a settlement, but they haven't given any guidance on what kind of pay offer they'd be prepared to give. Well, I think uh, trade unions would probably, and trade union members would probably see... Uh, want to see Labour more clearly on the side of workers. Uh, the Labour Party's uh, was created by workers' organisations and you would hope that Labour MPs and Labour leaders and so on would uh, see the justice of our cause. So I think there's a bit of frustration there. Uh, nevertheless, many Labour MPs have supported us and we, we welcome that. I think we would want to see more clear support that actually these disputes need to be resolved, there need to be pay rises. You can't endlessly drive down the wages mm. of public sector workers and expect public services to function. And that's the crisis we're in. Uh, you've got hundreds of thousands of workers in health, in ambulance service, teachers, and now in the fire and rescue service, saying, actually, we can't go on like this. We need to be able to pay the bills at the end of the month, and nobody's doing anything to address that. While I've got you, um, an independent report into the London Fire Brigade's union found in November some pretty awful examples of racism and sexism in the force. Female firefighters groped, people having their helmets filled with urine, a Muslim firefighter having bacon and sausages stuffed in his pockets. What's the culture uh, like? To, to be clear, that wasn't into the London Fire Brigade Union, that was into the London Fire Brigade. Yep. That's not, yes, and I, I, we Sorry, don't, apologies, we don't, if I said we, you, I didn't mean to say that. We don't run the London Absolutely Fire... Absolutely right, so into the London Fire Brigade. I don't run the London Fire Brigade. Sure. I think that, that is a shocking report, and there are other shocking reports which have been in the media over the past couple of weeks. Uh, though the people affected by that, in most cases, are members of our union, and each year we have to end up taking, for example, cases to employment tribunal on behalf of members who've been discriminated against, bullied and harassed. There has been far little done by chief fire officers, frankly, for 30 years in terms of recruitment, 
uh, equality, uh, making sure the fire service itself is more diverse, making sure that uh, management teams are more diverse. That's a complete failure of the people running the fire and rescue service. And yes, it should be addressed. We seek to build uh, a, a workplace which is welcoming, and most fire service workplaces are welcoming to people from all sorts of backgrounds. Uh, so these, these are horrific examples, but they're, they're clearly not everywhere. And we have, uh, we've created special sections. We have a women's section, LGBT section, black members section, to make sure that the views of underrepresented groups in the fire service are heard within our union. I can't talk for yeah. management structures, but within our union, they are heard and we've, we've uh, attempted to I was interested that. when you said that there's been effectively a failure of leadership over 30 yeah. years. Um, do you think that they get it now or do you think that actually more needs to be done? I don't know whether they get it now because uh, we we hear a lot of platitudes, frankly, and there's a lot of tick box exercises mm. where people say, we've introduced a new policy. I'm, I'm not sure that just a new policy is adequate to do this. Mm. If you go back 20, when some of these debates started, there was joint working with us because the vast majority of the workforce are members of our union. Uh, I've been, you know, 25 years ago, mm. uh, doing joint seminars, actually that most of that has ended. So first of all, equality teams have been cut back as part of the cuts. Uh, there has been a retreat. The, 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 the first thing the coalition government in 2010 did was scrap all equality targets. Mm. So there's been a, 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 the foot taken off the gas by central government as well mm. in relation to equality in the fire service. It's really interesting uh, to talk to you. Uh, thanks very much um, for coming on the programme. Thanks, Sophie. Well. Thank you. You're watching uh, Sophie Ridge uh, on uh, Sunday. A busy show uh, with our uh, interviews with uh, Grant Chaps uh, and Matt uh, Rack there of the fire service uh, coming on. It really does feel, doesn't it, uh, like those strikes uh, next week are an awful uh, long way uh, from being resolved. Still to come on the programme uh, this morning, we are going to be talking to uh, Labour's Shadow Business Secretary, uh, Jonathan Reynolds, see what he made uh, of that call uh, for Labour to be more clearly on the side of workers. And a little bit later, we're going to be hearing from the man who inspects the Met, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, Matt Parr. will be interested to hear uh, his take uh, on some of those stories around the Met Police. We'll also get some immediate reaction from our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, who's watching all of our interviews uh, this morning, we'll speak to him uh, in a little bit. I'm looking forward to hearing his view on that uh, 4,000 words from his trust uh, as well. Right, well, let's get Labour's take this morning, uh, shall we? I'm joined by the party Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you for being on the programme this morning. Um, I just want to get your reaction uh, to what Matt Rack of the uh, Fire Brigades uh, Union had to say. He said, look, strikes are coming. We want to see a Labour Party that is more clearly on the side of workers. You know, this is your opportunity to be clear. What is your take on the strikes next week? Would you give workers the pay rise that they want? Well, look, my dad was a fireman for 30 years, right? So I know from a personal experience exactly what those members that Matt talked about are, are experiencing, why they are going on strike, and he's right to say there's a very significant mandate for that. We have been clear. We have to, we have to only say the government must negotiate. I can't give a figure for any individual pay dispute the same way the people negotiating can't on television because that's part of the negotiation. But I would say we are absolutely aware and have consistently made clear that the reason so many people are taking industrial action is because they have seen their living standards, their, their real wages, you know, what they can purchase, diminish so much over the last 13 years. I mean, one of the few things I agreed with in Liz Truss's uh, essay that she's penned today is the point where she says, compared to other European countries, compared to parts of America, the UK has stagnated over the last 13 years and living standards have fallen. I don't agree with her proposals no. that she put forward to meet that, and I think she very clearly made that a lot worse. But we do understand that. But we've also got, Sophie, a very, very strong eye and discipline in making clear we believe our plans for the economy will make it grow faster than it has done for the last 13 years. But of course you need to do that to give people over the long okay. term the, the kind of improvements they quite rightly expect. I don't know if I'm being slightly slow here, but I, do, I just don't understand why you can't give a figure. You said there that, you know, Labour can't give a figure for the same reason that the unions can't give a figure, because they're involved in the negotiation. But you're not involved in the negotiation. 
I don't understand why you can't give a figure on what, what pay rise you would give to public sector workers. Well, you've got different issues in different disputes. I mean, part of the NHS dispute is very clearly about workload. OK, so let's talk, about, in, say, let's talk about specific things. The would you give nurses a 10% pay rise? Realistically, the top opening offer, no, we probably wouldn't be able to meet that, but we would negotiate. And fundamentally, we have a much more compelling message about those workload problems because we've got that plan to abolish the non-DOM rule for the super rich and therefore use that revenue over three billion pounds to vastly increase the numbers of doctors, nurses, midwives in the system. So that would be part of the negotiation. But I don't think if the people who are directly involved in disputes can understandably come on television and give specific figures, it's not helpful, frankly, for us to do it. But we're very serious about understanding the burdens people are facing. And the fact the government has to recognise that and the big difference, and you heard it there from my opposite number, Grant Shapps, is that the government, frankly, rather than want to solve these disputes, they want to use them as excuses for the poor state of public services in the country after being in power for 13 years. They want to okay. use those disputes to say, that's why public services aren't working. Everyone in the country knows, even when there aren't days when industrial action is taking place, whether it's the railways or the health service, Things are not as they should be, and that is the responsibility of the government. I think everyone would, you know, agree that there is a lot of strain on public services <laughs> at the minute, but it does feel that uh, that did give a bit of clarity there, that, look, you would get around the table, you'd negotiate on uh, conditions and on pay as well, but 10% pay rises that match inflation would be unaffordable. Well, look, the government often cites, for instance, the, the 1970s, where you saw essentially a series of, of pay negotiations in excess of inflation as people started to expect it. And, of course, that leads to the kind of spiral that ultimately diminishes living standards even further. But let's be clear, I mean, the average settlement in the private sector last year was 7%, well below the rate of inflation. It's just that the public sector settlement was even more significantly behind that. So I don't think working people in this country are being unreasonable, but they do expect their government to listen to the pressures they're under. They would like a little bit of responsibility from the government because, let's be frank, you could argue that the last 13 years have been one of the most disappointing periods in the entire economic history of the United Kingdom, and I don't see the government really being honest and frank about that. So but, that, Labour, that but Labour wouldn't be able to match the pay, pay demands of public sector workers either. Well, I think we could settle these disputes fairly quickly if the government were to stand down and give us a chance of doing it, because I think we fundamentally understand those issues around workload, burden. You know, we talk about unprecedented levels of inflation, and that's right, but look at grocery inflation. I mean, it's 17% almost for a lot of, you know, people when they're going out doing their shopping, buying essential items for the household. So, of course, you see in those disputes incredible levels of turnout of people with very strong feelings about it. They're simply reflecting, you know, the position they're under. And I think many people, by the way, are looking at this and say, you know, now you've got a Conservative government that's been in power now for the same amount of time as the last Labour government. Well, are they better off after 13 years of that Conservative government? And for nearly everyone in this country, the answer is no. Looking ahead to the strikes next week, um, big, big NHS strikes, nurses, ambulance workers. I mean, you're a parent, which, you know, inevitably means you rely more on the NHS. Do you look at some of the headlines around, you know, NHS strikes and feel a bit worried? Well, I think any family does, anyone in the country does. But I've got to say, I feel worried now at the state of the NHS every day. I mean, you know, sometimes we'll joke to the kids, you've got to behave, you can't, you know, we haven't got time to go to A&E under a Tory government. <laughs> That's the kind of thing we'll say in our house because we know the pressures that it's under. And, and I, I don't think sometimes when the government tries to cite you know, the pressures of, of, of days when industrial action is taking place is, is the worry to families that they themselves are aware of just what kind of pressure and concerns there are out there every day because of the state of public services under their watch. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the other story I was talking to Grant Shapps about, which is the uh, forcible installation of prepayment metres. Obviously, a lot of people really struggling with their energy bills this uh, winter. And Mr Shapps was pretty scathing about Ofgem. He said that they'd had the wool pulled over their eyes, that they need to raise their game. Is he right? Well, I think the regulator's got some points to answer here, but I wouldn't mind a bit of leadership and accountability from the government as well. I mean, this was first raised in Parliament before Christmas. Three weeks ago, Labour called for an outright ban on the process till this was reviewed. It was clearly it's a national scandal. This. There's no mm. question of there. You skewered Grant Shapps immediately by the fact that he might have said it's a disgrace, but he wasn't saying he was going to stop it. He didn't say that he's going to call for a ban and insist that this isn't happening whilst this is looked into. The process here is deeply flawed. There is no clear definition of, of where this should happen, what, what, what would we constitute as vulnerable, how should debt be treated in that, and clearly what's been happening with the, the oversight in the courts of this is a huge problem as well. So we want an outright ban whilst this process is looked at again and some clear rules are put in place. 
And I think the fact that the, the Secretary of State hasn't been able to say that this morning and that hundreds of people, maybe thousands, have had this done to them in the three weeks since we called for that ban, he's got to be willing to accept responsibility for that. At the same time, though, um, the point that Grant Chaps was making was, look, there does have to be some kind of... Something has to happen if someone just doesn't pay their energy bill. I mean, do you accept that? Yeah, of course. If someone's going to pay the bill, I mean, that's absolutely right. But he tried to conflate the process of having a prepayment veto, which actually some people do want. They like to control their, their energy bills in that way. He tried to conflate that with the forced imposition of a prepayment meter, often with the law being broken. And that is something completely different. The government should be incredibly strong on that. They're not being strong enough okay. because there are no circumstances in which that should happen. I've got to ask you about the other big story of the day. I mean, you touched on it earlier. Uh, Liz Truss, come back. What's your reaction to a piece in the Sunday Telegraph? Just every week, will there ever be a Conservative willing to take responsibility for their own actions? I mean, Liz Truss had to stand down because her policies were incoherent and unsustainable. And the idea she's been brought down by a left-wing economic establishment, she's been brought down by straightforward economics. If you want to borrow money, as she did, and people don't think your plans mean you can pay it back, well, they're not going to lend you that money. I say the one thing she is right on it is the poor record of the government on the economy. There has been stagnation. There has been a, a diminishing of living standards. But you don't do that by seeking to borrow a, a huge amount of money for tax cuts for the well-off. And the idea that you know, people in the city who had no confidence in her and people making those trades that led to the, the huge pressures and the economy being crashed, the idea that they are somehow part of, of a left-wing conspiracy. This is really, to me, about the, the Conservative Party. There are a lot of people who want Boris Johnson back in the Conservative Party. Liz Truss clearly feels that she would seek to make a comeback herself. And I think the biggest danger to the country would be a fifth term of Conservative government, where, frankly, all these characters would seek to make a comeback themselves. Do you think that Rishi Sunak's a better Prime Minister than Liz Truss? Oh, I think there has been arguably no worse Prime Minister than Liz Truss. And I don't say that to be, to be mean, but, I mean, 49 days and the record she had and ultimately, you know, politics, it's about people. And there are many people in this country paying higher mortgage rates as a result of her actions. And that, that's had a huge impact on them, would do at any time, but in a cost of living crisis, it is. But I think fundamentally, you cannot simply judge a prime minister if they're better than the last absolutely dreadful one. You've got to judge them on, are they meeting the challenges the country faces? Rishi Sunak isn't. I don't think he's in control of the Conservative Party. I think he's a weak prime minister. And I think the big change we need will only come through a general election. And ourselves having the chance to put the case for a Labour government. No surprise there uh, that the answer uh, is the Labour government. Um, thank you uh, very much uh, for your opinion uh, on that, uh, Jonathan Reynolds. Uh, thanks for being in the studio this thank morning. You. Well, the, uh, as usual, the take will follow this uh, programme just after 9.30. So that's our chance to analyse today's interviews, talk through some news lines with our Deputy Political Editor, uh, Sam uh, Coates. But we can get a quick take from Sam now on what has stood out to him this morning. Um, Look, Sam, we've had all sorts of uh, discussion this morning about, you know, energy bills or whether it's uh, small boats, but I just want to talk to you about Liz Truss. What, what is the reaction to the Liz Truss comeback? Well, it's fascinating, isn't it, Sophie? The whole of Westminster is digesting the 4,000 words published in the Sunday Telegraph this morning, uh, where Liz Truss for the first time reflects on the 44 days that she had in power before she announced her resignation. And we were always going to be in line with a little bit of uh, revisionism. We were always going to be uh, heading to a little bit of self-justification whenever Liz Truss made her first intervention. But I suppose... Reading the whole thing, what I wasn't expecting was just how much, bluntly, the whole thing is an attack on Rishi Sunak. Because although he's not targeted by name in the piece, when you go through it, the attack on the drift to higher taxes, which is exactly what he's had to do since coming into office, whether it's the left-wing economic establishment, which appears to wrap up many of those institutions that Rishi Sunak says are important, like the Office for Budget Responsibility, the whole framing of it and the way that she needles her successor because she says she got a mandate, i.e. she was voted for by the Tory members. Uh, of course, we all know that he wasn't. Now, she claims that she was ousted by this so-called left-wing establishment. That's not 
true. She was ousted by the chairman of the 1922 committee, Graham Brady, who came to see her when the chaos got too much. But one other thought, Sophie. This morning you had Grant Shapps on responding for the government. Now, Grant Shapps hasn't held back in the past about Liz Truss. He's called her tin-eared. Other Tories this morning are saying that it's like a bull in a, ch like a bull in a china shop, blaming the China for getting broken. But Grant Shapps was quite moderate in his tone. Why? Well, despite all of the implied criticism of the current Prime Minister. This is not a government that feels it can pick a fight with Liz Truss and her acolytes at this point. That tells you a lot about the current Tory mood. Uh, yeah, it certainly does, uh, doesn't it, Sam? Uh, we'll have more from Sam uh, after the uh, main programme. Uh, that will be at 9.30. Now, it's the most important global relationship and it's not going well because tensions have been rising between the US and China for many years now and this week's growing row over a supposed Chinese spy balloon that flew over America has now been shot down is really not helping. The big fear, of course, uh, is a China, Chinese invasion of Taiwan in coming years and how the US-led West would respond. Uh, well, we can talk now uh, to the Conservative MP, Alicia Kens, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee and joins us now. Thanks so much for being uh, with us today. Um, so I want to talk to you about this spy balloon. China says, oh, look, it's just monitoring the weather. Is that at all credible? No, I don't think it is. I mean, the American government have made clear they see this to be an intelligence capability. It's the size of three buses. It was flying at 60,000 feet high. That's not really where you normally get your weather detail from. And also they've said that this is part of a pattern where they have seen this happening time and time again. Um, so I think there's no question that this was definitely intelligence capability. Now they've shot it down. The US will be able to work out exactly what intelligence capabilities it had on board. You know, it almost sounds like something out of a spy novel, doesn't it? Like, you know, like a spy balloon, a, you know, going over uh, the United States. There's been American TV channels that have been put on balloon watch. But, you know, despite the kind of gimmicks, if you like, this is actually quite serious, right? It is serious, but I do think it's important we don't take it out of proportion. What it confirms is that China has a real and meaningful interest in our capabilities, our ability to track uh, such items, but also what it wants to see on the ground. America has nuclear facilities in Montana, for example. But we do have far bigger concerns when it comes to China. I think what it will do is have, for the first time, a realisation amongst the American public. You know, they were literally sat at home and could see it outside their bedroom window that they are being spied on. But actually, every day, many of us are walking around with technology Technology such as TikTok in our pockets or Hick Vision cameras in our streets that are also recording us, recording how we walk, how we talk, our data, our networks, our friends, our allies. And we know these details are being sent back to China as well. So whilst it is important, actually, there are more meaningful things we should be concerned about. But for the US, what's really useful about this, and Blinken was right to cancel his visit, is that going into this visit, the China would have felt that it was in a, a slightly superior negotiating position because of the Pelosi visit to Taiwan. Now, actually, China will need to show willing, it will need to show meaningful effort to bring China back on board. And for the US, that's a really helpful opportunity to rebalance the diplomatic kind of uh, cards on the table. I just want to pick up on what you were talking there about uh, with TikTok, because it always blows my mind when I look at, you know, the number of people who use TikTok. I mean, I'm one of them, right? You know, you use the sort of videos. Are we being a bit Sophie, naive? get off it! Stop it! <laughs> Are we being naive? Are we? I'm worried now. Uh, we are. We are being naive. Um, so, look, you know, TikTok gave evidence to my committee where they said that there was no way that individuals working in China could get access to the data of Britons. But what we've now seen is that people working in China for TikTok hacked into European data so they could track down the source of a journalist. Because what TikTok does is it gives away the data that makes you most vulnerable. Who are you friends with? What are your interests? What are the interests you have that you may not want publicly disclosed? Who are you having private conversations with? The locations you go to. There's a reason why China has this app. There's a reason why they're buying up gay dating apps. Our data is a key vulnerability. And China is building a tech totalitarian state on the back of our data. So we have to get far more serious about protecting ourselves. And yes, whilst balloons are an important diplomatic spike and opportunity to have this conversation, our bigger concerns are this data penetration, pathway dependency that China's creating on Chinese companies, uh, the way in which they're intimidating those who sought refuge in the UK and around the world. These are the bigger concerns that we should be focused on. So that's your genuine advice then? Delete TikTok from your phone? 
without question. I don't have it on my phone. And actually, it's fascinating how often you speak to people and they go, I'm going home tonight to have a serious conversation with my children. It is not worth having that vulnerability on your phone. And it is the ultimate data source for anyone with hostile efforts. And the fact is now, this isn't just me saying, I'm worried, delete it. We have evidence that TikTok has been used to track down sources for journalists. Everyone should be concerned about that. You know, it feels, doesn't it, that there's been a lot of very correct and right focus on Russia um, because of the war in Ukraine and the activities of Putin. But do you think that perhaps the world has slightly taken its eye off the ball when it comes to China? So I think over the last two decades, we've been focused on the threats from terrorists who behave like states. And unfortunately, whilst we actually need to be looking at the states from um, states who behave like terrorists. Now, the issue is I, d I don't want to criticise too much the kind of golden era of relations with China, because you can understand why politicians around the world felt that was the right approach. But whilst they were investing in those positive relationships, they should have been planning to fail. Where they didn't plan to fail, we are now vulnerable. So we need to spend the next 20 to 40 years focusing on resilience, how we make ourselves protected at home and every single part of our society. Now, that doesn't lessen the threat from China, and I am really worried about what's going to happen in the few weeks before tanks arrive. I'm very worried about Putin's mass mobilisation. Um, however, China is a long-term strategic threat, but it requires significant effort from government in order to make us resilient. Um, now, while I've got you, it's fascinating to talk to you about um, foreign affairs, but I have to ask you about this uh, article by Liz Truss as well, 4,000 words in the Sunday Telegraph. She blames the left-wing economic establishment for her downfall. She blames Conservative MPs for not respecting her mandate. She blames her off communications strategy, the Office for Budget Responsibility. You know, the Conservative Party polls tanked under her uh, leadership. I just want to know, what was your reaction when you first read uh, Liz Truss's words? So I think uh, the best and polite way of saying it would be that recollection, uh, recollections do vary. Um, however, fundamentally, the markets are not left. They are not woke. Uh, unfunded promises are not tenable. And actually, the, ultimately, what ended Liz Truss's premiership was inability to manage the party. Number 10 telling the minister at the dispatch box one thing while telling the whips another on a rather crucial vote. It was that mismanagement of the party that is why MPs no longer had trust in Liz Truss anymore, and that is why her premiership ended. It feels like there's a couple of backseat drivers in the Conservative Party at the minute. Uh, Liz Truss um, planning uh, her comeback with more interventions in the coming week. We had Boris Johnson, of course, uh, giving uh, an interview uh, earlier this week as well. Is it helpful to the current man in the job? Look, I think um, all former prime ministers as backbenchers have every right to call for things, to try and shape policy. Um, but I think Theresa May has really set the standard of someone who came back in, put their head down, has worked really hard, recognises that their voice has a real uh, strength to it and to use it at the right times in the right way. And I think they should model themselves on her. OK, um, thank you uh, very much indeed, Alicia Cairns, uh, there, chair of the uh, Foreign you. Affairs uh, Select Committee there. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. I might have to go and delete TikTok uh, off my phone after that uh, interview. Now, on another uh, issue, it's hard to think of a time when the standing of the country's largest and most important police force has been lower. Another serial sexual predator who committed scores of rapes as a serving officer is behind bars, with hundreds more investigations underway. And, of course, all of that following the murder of Sarah Everard and evidence of a culture of misogyny and discrimination. Now, the new boss of the Met says he's changing the force and the organisation that inspects it is reviewing to see if progress is happening. Now, Matt Parr is His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, who joins us now. Thanks so much for being on the show. Um, I've been really looking forward to uh, interviewing you, uh, frankly. Uh, now, you d just talk through a bit what you do, because you independently assess, effectively, don't you, the efficiency and effectiveness uh, of the police in the public interest? Uh, that's right. I mean, what we don't do is individual complaints and individual individual things that go wrong. We're more interested in systemic matters, whether the police are effective, whether they're efficient, whether the public are getting the right service. And what is your assessment of that right now, then? Uh, for the Met in particular, uh, it's in a bad place. Uh, um, we all know that. Uh, it's well documented that public trust in the Met is at a low ebb. Uh, and we've got the, the Met in, quote, special measures, as it's sometimes caused. Uh, so I think there's a widespread recognition that there's an awful lot to be done. What's gone wrong with the Met? 
I've, in the past, I've described it as complacent, as arrogant, as defensive, uh, and I think there's been a reluctance to accept the scale of the, the problems, and it's, it's some lower-level leadership stuff, it's basic standards sometimes, uh, and it's a culture across the Met, and perhaps wider policing as well, that isn't where it ought to be. Now, of course, you, you're not commenting on individual cases rightly, um, but, you know, I, I, you know, just to reflect on what we've seen, you know, Wayne Cousins, a serving police officer, murdering Sarah Everard. David Carrick, another serving police officer, admitting 71 sex offenders. Serving police officers taking pictures of the bodies of two murdered sisters, sharing them on WhatsApp. Um, it, it's just... It's extraordinary. I, I kind of feel like in any other organisation, they'd just clear out the leadership team, like, the heads would go. Well, they have got a new commissioner and a new top team. Uh, I think under the under Mark Rowley, who's taken over, and his leadership team around him, it does feel different. I think they've smelt the coffee. They understand that they can't any longer sort of write this off as a few bad apples. It's something much more endemic than that. Uh, they've got a long way to go, however. This is not something that you're going to turn around overnight. There's 42,000 people in the Met. Uh, and what they've got to get to uh, is just every one of those people behaving at all times uh, in a way that the public have a right to expect. Now, the police are the public and the public are the police, and this is this sort of saying that goes way back. Uh, but we should, I think we're entitled to hold the police to a, to a higher standard than the general public, and, and so particularly in the last few months I've been uh, inspecting on vetting and who gets in uh, and misconduct procedures, uh, and they're not tight enough, it's too easy for the wrong people to join the police, uh, we've made lots and lots of recommendations uh, that, if enacted, should start to turn things around. Yeah, on vetting, I was interested, you said recently your analysis showed around one in ten officers should never have made it through vetting. Well, that was one in ten of the cases we looked at, which right. wasn't a random sample. OK. Uh, but it still adds up to hundreds of people who have joined the police in the last three years that we don't think should have. And what, what just... Can you just explain, what does that mean? Is that because they've had prior convictions? Is that because they... What, what is it? Uh, yeah, it's all of that. It's prior convictions, it's links with criminals that are too close and not really explained. Uh, it's not being entirely honest on their application. It's a whole series of things like that that we looked at and just said, this person shouldn't have joined. I mean, these are clear red flags, right? This is not giving, like, a bit of a shaky answer in an interview. That's the big red flag. Yeah, big red flags. Now, what there shouldn't be is a zero-tolerance approach that anybody that's got any blemish on their record uh, shouldn't automatically be disbarred from being a police officer. That just wouldn't be fair. But where there is a question, where there is doubt, uh, there should be measures put in place to, to monitor these people, to keep a closer eye on them, uh, and that's not happening either. Um, I've got to ask you, um, this has been going on for a while. Have you guys been doing your jobs properly as well? You know, you're supposed to be inspecting the police. Why hasn't all this been well, we're, raised... We're, we're not a regulator, we're an inspectorate, and we've been saying this for years and years and years. I think what happened last year after the, the Wayne Cousins murder uh, is the Home Secretary then got us to look specifically at the Met's counter-corruption, uh, at vetting across policing to, to, to tie up some of these issues. Now... The carrot case uh, came out after we'd done this inspection, but if you look at our recommendations, the majority of them were very pertinent to, to, to the sort of things that went wrong in Carrick. So I am quietly confident now uh, that if all the recommendations get enacted, we're going to change, and, and Swella Braverman, who now commissioned me to come back to her in April and see how all the police forces around the country are getting on with enacting those recommendations. So, so there is a kind of weight of mm. effort behind this and a recognition that it has gone on too far and it's got to change. It's interesting that you said you have been flagging this for a while. Who hasn't been listening to you? Is it previous Home Secretaries? Is it the police? What... No, I don't think you blame an, an individual. This is systemic across policing. I think policing is challenged. It's got a lot to do. We're always uh, challenging the police what their priorities are. Uh, but I think the whole idea of just how important it is for policing that the wrong, the wrong people don't get in and the wrong people don't stay in has not, has not quite been recognised as being as important as it is. Yeah, I, mean, I guess that one of the reasons it's important is public confidence in the police. And I'm thinking, you know, particularly about you know, women and particularly women who are reporting sexual crimes to the police as well. And, you know, if you look at the statistics, you know, maybe they're right to not have confidence. I think it's around 1% of reported rapes uh, end uh, in a conviction. I mean, has rape effectively been decriminalised? I think when our report, we looked specifically at police misconduct through the eyes of, uh, uh, of women serving in policing. And while there are plenty of women who've had great careers and, and gone to the top of policing, most of them, if not all of them, have had to endure some completely unacceptable behaviour mm. uh, on the way there. So I'm not talking about, you know, slightly ribald comments. Sure. I'm talking about sexual assault in many cases. 
uh, totally inappropriate behaviour in the workplace. By fellow officers. By fellow officers and then being reluctant to report it because you think you'll be the person that's then stigmatised in some way as a result. So the culture of misogyny within policing uh, it, it is something that is there, it's real, and it's absolutely got to be dealt with. That's really concerning as well, isn't it? Because, you know, if, if people are going to the police for help with, you know, the most sensitive things, the things that, you know, people feel have ruined their lives, frankly, and you're saying that you can't really necessarily trust that the person you're dealing with is, is not going to be mis misogynistic. I mean, I think, I think my, my, my message to the public generally would be, in general, you should trust the police. What I think we're aiming for here uh, is a situation where there's an, it's an automa we're automatically yeah. assuming that we can trust the police without having to ask these questions. I think there's a long way to go before we're there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested to know your thoughts as well uh, on the London uh, Fire Brigade. Uh, I know that you look at uh, fire services as well. An independent report in November finding some pretty awful examples of racism, sexism. And we did speak to the uh, union leader of the London Fire Brigade's uh, union uh, as well. And he was saying, look, there is a failure of leadership and we've been flagging it for a while as well, the union, and they're not doing enough. Uh, well... <laughs> Many of the problems with the London Fire Brigade are mirrored mm. uh, in the Met. We've also actually got the London Fire Brigade in, quote, special measures, mm. uh, largely as a result of, of, of a really un, unpleasant culture that's highlighted in the report you refer to. So we get that. Uh, I think fire services, like police, have got a long way to go uh, to reform and, and be the sort of workplace that I think the public has a right to expect, and they're a long way from it. OK, thank you so much for being on the programme. It's been really interesting, uh, and thank you for speaking so frankly about some of the issues you see uh, in the police and also the fire brigade. Thank you. Uh, just before uh, we go, a quick reminder of our weekly podcast. If you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can find the Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast and subscribe, so it's in your feed every week. There's highlights of all of the uh, best interviews, some post-match analysis, and a bit of an insight into how we put the programme together. Now, today, I'm quite looking forward to it because we are joined by Camilla Turner. Now, she uh, is the person who has her byline uh, on that 4,000-word uh, article by Liz Truss. So I'm very uh, interested to see what Camilla Turner of The Telegraph has to say. Uh, and as usual, uh, by our editor, Scott Beasley, who I'm always interested to know what Scott has to say, of course. Um, you can find it and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Sophie Ridge on Sunday. It should be available later today. Well, that's it for this week's uh, programme. In a moment after the break, we're going to be talking to uh, Sam Coates, running through today's interviews, uh, having a bit of a chat about what we learned. So don't go anywhere.
Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge, The Take, where we take a moment and look back at this morning's interviews uh, with a bit of analysis uh, from Sky's deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, as well. And I have to say, it was a really interesting uh, morning coming in uh, to work uh, this morning uh, to be hit by 4,000 words to read uh, before the show. So it's lucky I got uh, in early uh, because this really, I think, kind of set the uh, tone for some of the political debate uh, today. We can bring Sam in uh, at this point, uh, shall we? Uh, so, Liz Truss, the comeback. I mean, we knew it was coming, didn't we? There's been lots of trailing uh, over the last few days about uh, the fact that the former Prime Minister wanted to make uh, a big uh, intervention. And here we have it. What, what was your sort of main takeaway? Well, Sophie, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, it just makes your head hurt reading it. Because to, to call it revisionism is, is, is polite. Um, the, the way in which Liz Truss has decided now to effectively recast what happened in her favour. She was the shortest serving prime minister uh, in British history. Uh, the front page of the Metro the next day after she left called her the worst prime minister uh, in uh, the UK's history. She left an economic log legacy that saw mortgage rates higher uh, as a result of the decisions that she took. And this is essentially a piece of 4,000 word, not only self-justification, but also attack on the man that took over from her. Um, but, but for me, some of the most interesting passages are her recasting of what happened in key debates during her period in power. And, and, and if you look at the headline that's been put on it, the, he the Sunday Telegraph has chose to, chosen to focus on the pessimism of the what's called the left-wing economic establishment in Liz Truss's view, essentially the Treasury and the Office for Budget Responsibility. So the two kind of great big kind of civil servant uh, institutions at the heart of our economic system. And Liz Truss's argument is that these institutions are inherently pessimistic. They don't believe enough in bold growth measures uh, and also essentially failed her by failing to point out that there was a great big problem with these pension funds uh, that has existed since the early 2000s, but they didn't work, warn her uh, that they could be, as it were, disturbed, uh, that there could be pressure on the pension system as a result of the decisions that she was taking. And that shows that these institutions are... Flawed, and, and I can quite understand that if there are some people sitting in the Treasury today going, well, that's just baloney, because what happened, as far as I understood all the way along, is that people all across government were very clearly advising Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting not to embark on what's cutely now called the mini budget, that extraordinary bonanza of spending and borrowing that we got in early September. Don't do it because we might not be able to afford it to a, as a country and that's going to push up borrowing costs and that's going to have a huge impact on everyone. They were warned, they were warned, and, and ultimately, not least because the first act of the former Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng was to sack the lead civil servant in the Treasury, and the message came down, we're not interested in listening to your objections, Liz Truss just ignored the Treasury. So far from this being the Treasury and the left-wing uh, kind of economic establishment's fault, um, by the way, it's quite hard to, to really characterise markets as left-wing, as she appears to do in this article, she ignored them all the way along because she sort of didn't believe in what they were saying for all the reasons that she sets out in that article, pressed ahead, and then there were the economic consequences that were that were warned about. And, and, and that's just not the way that she chooses to tell it. And that's the core of the argument that she makes, that effectively she says she was let down by these institutions. I think the truth was they warned her and she ignored them. Yeah, it feels like there's two slightly contradictory things that she's trying to say at the same time. Number one, that she wasn't warned enough about what would happen if she enacted her plan. And secondly, that they didn't buy into her plan enough either because of the left-wing uh, economic consensus. I'm, I'm not totally sure how both of those things can be right. Uh, just quickly, um, I just want to point out the mug uh, behind Sam uh, in Liz We Trust. Great bit of uh, background. I'm sure that's completely... Um... There we go. Excellent bit of uh, prop management uh, this morning, Sam. Yeah. 
<laughs> really enjoy that. And um, before we uh, go back to Sam, I just want to uh, listen a little bit to uh, that interview uh, with the business secretary, uh, Grant Shapps, because one thing that jumped out to me uh, from the uh, Liz Trust piece was that she said, I will expand upon the lessons that I've learned in the coming weeks and months, which I think really is perhaps something that will send a shiver down the spine of people in Rishi Sunak's uh, Downing Street and also perhaps uh, explains why people like Grant Shapps aren't exactly going in two-footed against Liz Trust because they're a little bit worried about what she might have to say in future. Let's have a listen to Grant Shapps. I think anybody who has served uh, in, in public office has a right to put across their arguments. That's what we do as politicians, right? You, 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 you say what you believe and you put them across. What we do know is what happened when we followed that route without having laid the groundwork. So I completely agree with Liz's instinct to have a lower tax economy. What we also know is if you do that before you've dealt with inflation and dealt with the debt, then you end up in, in, in difficulty and you can't get the growth out of nowhere. So, I mean, I'm, look, I, I think the main thing for people to know is Rishi Sunak's come in, he's removed that premium that we saw because the markets didn't like what was going on back then. Uh, well, let's get uh, Sam's take, uh, shall we? You can bring him back uh, from his uh, South London uh, broadcasting studio. Um, Sam, what, what did you make of the Grant Chats response? Well, it was quite tepid, wasn't it, in terms of hitting back and defending uh, uh, or really attacking Liz Truss in the way that she attacked uh, the Prime Minister. Now, I just want to re rewind to early October, Sophie. Guess which prominent Conservative was at the forefront of laying in to Liz Truss and her premiership? Well, it was only Grant Chaps who um, was excluded from Grant Chaps's, uh, from Liz Truss's cabinet on the grounds that Liz Tr Truss thought he picked the wrong team by backing Rishi Sunak in the summer leadership contest. And uh, contest. and um, uh, Grant Chaps turned up to Tory conference in um, was it Manchester, uh, in Birmingham, sorry, and basically spent the entirety of. Uh, that conference, slugging it out with Liz Truss in the TV studios, uh, pointing out the problems with the economic plan that she had embarked on, and really um, was not in any way tepid or timid about attacking her. But this is the same guy that sort of has very much this morning done a, on the one hand, on the other, uh, uh, attempt to deal with Liz Truss. And, and that's because the fissures, the divisions that we talk about every week on this slot inside the Conservative Party can't go away and, um, and, and, and are very much still there. And, and the job, I think, of Number 10 at this difficult moment for them is to try and not inflame the irritation of Tory colleagues, many of whom, um, through the uh, uh, sort of defenestration of Liz Truss, lost their job jobs, back the wrong person, still feel sore, um, and yet need to be relied upon for difficult decisions, uh, for votes in the House of Commons, whether it's on the Northern Ireland Protocol, making sure they don't kick off too much when Boris Johnson faces the Privileges Committee, uh, also having to deal with stuff around the European Convention of Human Rights and not causing too much of a revolt around that. So the, the mood isn't, it isn't possible in Tory circles for Number 10 to come out swinging, perhaps as aggressively as they would like, against Liz Truss. She's She's got more uh, fuel in the can. She's done an interview, uh, which is actually going to be a video interview with The Spectator uh, magazine. That's going to be released at five o'clock tomorrow. So that'll be the first time where journalists, particularly to The Spectator, Katie Balls, is going to put questions to Liz Truss about exactly what what got on, because the Sunday Telegraph article, obviously, no uh, opportunity to challenge what Liz Truss says in that. She just presents uh, her case. So Katie Balls will be doing that tomorrow. We'll get to see on camera Liz Truss's reaction uh, and and uh, response to the questions that I think we've all got. So there's a lot left, but Liz Truss still has some fans in the Tory party, and there are a lot of fans of cutting taxes and perhaps taking on some of the economic establishment. So this isn't a fight that Number 10 can risk having too aggressively. Yeah, it's certainly when, as you say, there is clearly more to come. It feels quite choreographed, uh, doesn't it? Um, one person who wasn't holding back, though, unlike Grant Shapps, uh, was the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan uh, Reynolds. Uh, he really went in on, on the former Prime Minister. Let's have a listen to Labour's take. Will there ever be a Conservative willing to take responsibility for their own actions? I mean, Liz Truss had to stand down because her policies were incoherent and unsustainable. And the idea she's been brought down by a left-wing economic establishment, she's been brought down by straightforward 
economics. If you want to borrow money, as she did, and people don't think your plans mean you can pay it back, well, they're not going to lend you that money. I say the one thing she is right on it is the poor record of the government on the economy. There has been stagnation. There has been a, a diminishing of living standards. But you don't do that by seeking to borrow a, a huge amount of money for tax cuts for the well-off. Uh, Jonathan Reynolds there. I think he also described Liz Truss as possibly the worst Prime Minister we've ever had, uh, which is quite a uh, statement. I mean, I guess from Labour's perspective, this is all quite good, right? Reminding voters uh, of the time uh, of the mini-budget when everything went wrong and also about the current divisions in the Conservative Party that you've been discussing. Oh, it's a complete gift for Labour in, in, in every way. Uh, we've got uh, Liz Truss, not forgotten, but now back in the headlights, promising this and more. You've got the spectre of Liz Truss and Boris Johnson perhaps even teaming up over things like uh, opposition to forthcoming deal on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, you've got one of the worst periods in Britain's modern economic history being uh, picked over to Labour's benefit. Uh, and you've got clear signs that Number 10 just holding back slightly in the way that it's responding. Uh, and Tory MPs, uh, like the one you were talking to, uh, clearly angry and in despair at the return of Liz Truss uh, stealing all the headlines. Look, Sophie, again, we sit here every week and we've been asking for several weeks, when is Rishi Sunak's government going to be able to get on the front foot with its own agenda? Uh, there are plans underway to try and reset the debate around migration, tough new plans, possibly taking on the European uh, uh, Strasbourg courts when it comes to to uh, pushing the boundaries to stop people being able to claim asylum in this country. You were talking to Grant Shapps about that, but it was sort of item number three or so in the interview. Last week, it was all about Nadim uh, Zahawi's resignation. We've still got the unfinished business, potentially, of Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab and what's happening with those uh, possibly 24 bullying allegations. We are now in February. Rishi Sunak came in right at the start of November. Hasn't really had a great deal of time where he's been able to set the agenda in the way uh, that he wants. The only claim that Rishi Sunak really was making on the first 100 days is that he managed to lower the temperature economically and undo some of the damage that Liz Truss did to the Tories' economic competence reputation. And here we are picking through the bones of that with a very significant figure suggesting that Rishi Sunak was wrong even to do that. So it's very, very painful. There is a tone in Liz Truss's article Article, frankly, of extraordinary self-pity that everybody was against her. But I also detect a tone amongst some of those around Rishi Sunak of self-pity there uh, as well, as they have to deal with all the problems caused by their predecessors. It's just a sort of very miserable place being in the Conservative Party at the moment. Everybody feeling sorry for themselves. I'm just not quite sure that's where the public view it. Yeah, it does feel like that, actually, doesn't it? Whenever you con talk to Conservative MPs, they, they do have this gloominess, this kind of existential like, despair about the direction of their party, whatever uh, faction they're from and whatever direction they think the party should be going in. I mean, one of those, I guess, was Elisir Kearns. Now, I was speaking to her. It was a fascinating interview, actually, about uh, US-China relationships, about Chinese influence in the UK, but I did also ask her about Liz Truss. She said uh, that former prime ministers should model themselves on Theresa May. All former prime ministers as backbenchers have every right to call for things, to try and shape policy. Um, but I think Theresa May has really set the standard of someone who came back in, put their head down, has worked really hard, recognises that their voice has a real uh, strength to it and to use it at the right times in the right way. And I think they should model themselves on her. They should be modelled on Theresa May, Sam. Well, <laughs> Theresa May, of course, played a big role ousting predict particularly Boris Johnson and then uh, didn't seem to be a particular fan of Liz Truss. Perhaps courts controversy with the extraordinary amount of outside earnings uh, that she makes, including giving speeches in Saudi Arabia. So it's not a universally adored model of being an ex-Prime Minister. Uh, but uh, Alicia Kent, always a, a fascinating voice to listen to. She doesn't uh, pull her punches as an important select committee uh, chairwoman and basically, I suspect, voicing the kind of frustration that uh, many in the Conservative Party uh, feel this morning. Interview, um, I was really struck as well because she literally ordered me to get off TikTok. She was like, look, 
don't trust TikTok. Um, it's a Chinese-owned uh, uh, organisation. You should be very worried about it. That would unequivocally be my advice. Are you on TikTok, Sam? Are you going to delete it? Uh, I, uh, I don't... I, 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 I'm not on TikTok. Things by me might be put on TikTok by others. Um, I, it, it's a weird one. Um, I don't like TikTok because of the way it sort of treats the news, as it were, and everything becomes a bit more of a sort of arm of entertainment rather than uh, rather than anything else. Half the time you seem to be expected to dance, and that's not something uh, really uh, that you want to see me do. Uh, but the concerns about security have been well uh, I think, picked over in uh, the last few uh, months and years. In America, the debate is incredibly aggressive around China, whether or not Chinese social media apps are uh, safe for people uh, to use. Uh, and it looks like there is a wing of the Conservative Party that's pushing that debate here. Uh, and Parliament was going to have a TikTok account. That now uh, has been scrapped in light of some of the uh, arguments uh, and bans of UK uh, MPs from being able to go to China. Uh, and I think that this debate is going to continue Continue to go in this uh, direction. You only have to look at the uh, temperature around that debate in America about the Chinese balloon. They say a weather balloon, the US say uh, a spy balloon that's uh, just been shot down over the weekend to know that UK China relations are in a uh, and US China relations uh, are in a difficult place. And if, as Alicia Kern says, the Chinese government effectively can mine data from individuals uh, from apps like TikTok. I think a lot of people find that quite serious. Interesting stuff. Um, just to end, Sam, I wondered if we could get a bit of a thought, a bit of an analysis from you about you know the sort of state of the government right now, Rishi Sunak's position. You know, you've had this intervention from Liz Truss that you rightly say is effectively an attack uh, on the current man in the job and the nervousness around how to deal with that from the common cabinet because he's got all of these things that he needs to get through. How precarious do you think his position is? Well, Sophie, I've got one massive question about Rishi Sunak's government, which is when push tough comes to shove, can it actually get anything done? Right. It has succeeded in calming the economic turmoil that we're talking about later. Actually, to be fair, borrowing costs on mortgages are back where they were before the mini budget. So that's quite a big success. But the question now is, can Rishi Sunak actually do anything proactively because he doesn't have a mandate from the members or uh, his mandate from the public stretches back to Boris Johnson's election win. He's trying to do a couple of massive controversial things when it comes to strike legislation, possibly dealing with the Northern Ireland Protocol on Brexit and maybe uh, in some way taking on the European Convention on Human Rights in order to deal with the small boats problem. Does he have the numbers in Parliament? Does he have the political will within the Conservative Party to push through difficult things? I don't yet know. That's the essay question. Because, Sophie, if a government can't do something and isn't governing, does it last? I, I, that's the issue. Uh, really uh, interesting. And that, I guess, is the big test that we haven't yet had. Uh, but it does feel like those things are on the horizon. They're coming up. They can't be avoided uh, too much longer. Always uh, really interesting to uh, talk, Sam. Go and get some tea in your Liz Trust mug or a coffee. <laughs> we'll uh, see you next week. Uh, always good to uh, talk. That's uh, our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. Well, that is it from Sophie Ridge on Sunday. The take this morning, the podcast will follow, including, of course, uh, analysis from Camilla Turner of The Telegraph, who are the people who published uh, that extraordinary 4,000-word essay from Liz Truss. Always good to see you.